Good morning, everybody. I am hoping you're going jolly this morning. And uh, I'm your host, Winifred Adams, and we are here in virtual space. You, and welcome to the show, Making Life Brighter. And we are going to definitely make your lives brighter today. And we need this in our world. And we have a very special guest that I promised you. We have Mr. Carlton Santa Davis. And Santa, welcome. Thank you for coming to Making Life Brighter and being with us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Now, for those of you that are in a time warp or basically musically challenged and do not know who this amazing soul is, of course, I will do the special introduction. He is a musician that has worked with um, Bob Marley, and he's worked with all kinds of musicians, Pink, and he's worked with Carlos Santana. He is a percussionist, a drummer. He's a backing vocalist. He is an artist extraordinaire. And most of all, he's a very, very sweet soul. And he's come through all kinds of trials and tribulations. He was born in Jamaica and he lives here in Los Angeles. And I'm so happy to have him with us today. Thank you for being with us today, Santa. Thank you. Yes. yes. He is a bright soul with extraordinary musical talent. And he brings forth all of that. And he's worked with some of the greatest artists over time. So I just want to jump in because you have such an amazing background in history. I'm just going to dive in. Okay, I would like great. to know what it is that you haven't done yet that you would like to do in music because you've done so much. You've been everywhere. Well, um, one of my um, dream was to tour the Middle East, oh. what they call the Middle East. That's before all this crazy stuff that happening with terrorism and stuff. I always wanted, I, I, was, I would always think I would like to do a tour of that area of the world because I've toured everywhere else. Mm -hmm. All of Europe, you know, the Caribbean, the US, of course. So that was, that is one thing that I, I would have loved to do, but you know, at this time, at this time in our life, you know, what's going on over here, it wouldn't be a feasible or a great idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't do it now as easily. But right. maybe maybe in the next year or two. And, and what is it that you're working on right now? Let's just come to the present of what you're creating or, you know, you're working with Ziggy. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm currently, you know, Ziggy's drummer, but, you know, um, we should... We should have been on the road right now, but unfortunately, because of you know this um, dangerous problem we have right now, you know everybody have to everything is kind of on hold right now. But in the meantime, between time, I'm home and I'm doing little projects with friends of mine, and I'm here mixing some stuff for a friend of mine, and I'm also working on some new stuff for myself, you know. So just you know, you keep the wheel turning, you know, instead yeah. of just sitting down twiddling your thumbs and I just say, you know what, let me be productive even in this crazy time, you know? Yeah, it's almost like a better time to be creative in a way because the world's a little slower and you can think and you can feel that inspiration. Right, you know? because I'm learning new things, you know, even because I'm using, you know, modern technology with studio pro tools and all that stuff. So it gives me time to sit down and experiment and try different things. You know, I'm in this little room and I have my drum kit. I have all types of instruments in there and I'm playing all of them. So it's like, it's crazy to see how sometimes, you know, situations might look bad, but it's sometimes a good, it's a good thing for your sanity and for your creativity. So <laughs> I'm doing things that I never thought I could have done. So I say, oh, you know what? Maybe it's a good thing. <laughs> <It's happening. laughs> even That's though, cool. even though I must say, you know, my condolences to all the people who are afflicted with this terrible d disease, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's not, it's yeah. not like a laughing matter, but in a way, you know, sometimes you have to take, um, you, you know, you have to take disappointments and turn it into positives. And, you know, even though there are people suffering, you know, but at the same time, you have to keep moving instead of just sitting down and moaning and groaning and stuff like that. You know, you still concern about you know 
people who are going through hard, hard times right now because we, in, in my field, as you know, I mean, we are like at a standstill right now. We can't do nothing, you know, and it's, it's very difficult because, you know, I, I'm used to playing for people. Yeah. Now, I would stay home and every now and again, I might do a little live thing, but it's not the same. You know, I just, you know, play around on my drums or maybe I go on Facebook Live and I kind of like talk to people and they respond back to me. But, you know, I, all this will pass. So, but in the in the same breath, I just keep going. You know, just. Do. Well, you have had a life like that, really. I mean, you've yeah. had a very blessed life from the beginning, and all of your journeys, including the tragedy that you experienced. Oh yeah. You picked up, and you keep moving through that. We'll come back to that. We'll, we'll go into that some more. But yeah. I I would really love to talk a little bit about your family and your history. Um, what kind of inspiration did you draw from your grandmother or your grandparents that brought you into your your music? I have a strong feeling that has something to do with you. <laughs> well, you know, to be honest with you, um, I'm one of those um, I'm one of those rare individual because I'm I'm certainly have heard of a lot of people. I I didn't know none of those people. I, no. I, I'm, an, I'm an only child. I don't know no grandmother, no grandfather, none of, none of, it's kind of weird, you know, it's, it's kind of like I was an orphan, but I wasn't, you know, I only knew my mom, and I didn't know all the backstory, and I didn't ask her anything, she passed away a couple of years ago, oh. but I didn't ask her about, you know, I was just like, well, maybe this is just my life. As a kid growing up, it was kind of weird, because I would see people, you know, talking oh, I'm going to go visit grandma, grandpa, or my cousins, or whatever. And I was like, hmm, okay. I've never experienced that kind of thing. I grew up with just my mom. That's the only person I knew. And, you know, she, I think I learned everything from her because, you know, she brought me up. Was to, she musical? No, well, she used to go to church. She was a church lady. Yeah. And she would sing. I mean, she wouldn't sing around the house, but every now and again, she would sing the list, you know, little things. But um, she wasn't really a musician. She wasn't like a musical person, you know. So it, but I grew up in a place, Jamaica, yeah. where, where it was musical. So I guess that's where. <laughs> you took your inspiration, but I bet you that allowed you to focus on what you were doing. You didn't. Yes, have, because. You know. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because, you know, the thing is this, growing up in Jamaica, you couldn't help but hear music. Music was all around, every day, all the time, you know? And, you know, as a kid growing up, I was exposed to all that because back in Jamaica when I was growing up in the 60s, it was, um, there was a lot of uh, what they call sound systems. And these guys used to string their stuff up, big speaker boxes and you know, and they would just play records, you know? And every weekend, every weekend from like Friday to Sunday, there was um, music playing in my area. They, they used to have these places they call dance halls where, you know, and, and I was living, I was living in the middle of three of those places, oh. one up the street, <laughs> one down the street and one across the way. And, and these guys, they would compete and they, <laughs> they would have these, what they call steel horns. They were like um, speaker system, but they, was, they call them steel horns. And they would turn them in different directions. And you would you'd be miles away to hear that. So, you, so that, that would make you know, okay, there's a dance going. Because on, on the weekends, people used to always want to find some place to go. And it's not like nowadays when you have Facebook and you have all these, these different... Um, social media thing where you can look and say, oh, something is happening here, and you go right. over there. On the weekends, people are like, I want to go somewhere tonight. Where, uh, and they would hear the sound coming from like where, wherever, miles away, and they would follow that sound. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real. So, I mean, some people would know that there's a dance in the area, but people like far away would hear it, and they would hear the music. And they would like, oh, wait a minute, I got to go there. And they would whether they walk, ride, drive, or whatever, they would they would get there. But 
for me, I was in the middle of it. So you, so you had to endure all of that until three, four o'clock in the morning. It was just, well, you got used to it. It's not like here in America where, you know, you can't do that. You know, right. you have to, you know, you, you kind of want to go to a certain time. In Jamaica, it, 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 there was a real noise abatement kind of law, you know? It was mm -hmm. just, because people enjoyed it. It was kind of like a special, you know, time, you know, every weekend you expect it. So you say, ah, whatever, you know? And mm -hmm. you sleep through it sometimes. You know, if you, you get used to the sound that it doesn't bother you anymore. So I grew up in the middle of all that, and that was like, from an early age, and I just kept hearing music, 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 and you know. And so, who was your early inspiration? Did you have anyone that you aspired to outside of Jamaica? Well, okay, so saying Jamaica was a musical country, right? They used to play a lot of um, foreign records, and they, a lot of jazz. They, you know, these people would set their music stuff up, and they would play a lot of foreign stuff, you know, because that's all we had. So they would buy all these records. People go, you know, would come to America back then or go to Miami, which is the closest to Jamaica. Right. And yeah. they would buy up all these, or New York, you know, whatever. And they would buy up all these records and they bring them home and sell them and whatever. So we used to hear a lot of jazz. And I grew up, I grew up listening to that. Can you hear it? It's around you. And then I would hear these older guys talking about Max Roach and all these guys was like, Max Roach, who's Max Roach? Oh, the, <laughs> one of the greatest drummer ever, you know? So I hear them talking about this this guy, Max Roach. Oh, man, that, that guy, he can play the drums or whatever. And I hear them talking about that. And that's the first time, you know, that's the first um, American drummer I heard about, Max Roach, you know? And then you, you grew up hearing that, hearing that and they keep, so it, it, it's, I was attracted to music. So it was like, I was into jazz or into this, just music. So, but I would hear a lot of that. So my first influence maybe might have been Max Roach because I heard them talking about him all the time. Yeah. So, and, and you know, I keep, it keeps like ringing in my head like Max Roach, Max Roach. And I can, just like you, the question is funny. People ask me this question all the time, but you ask me, the question direct and now I can remember that Max Roach was actually the first American drummer I heard about you know so I guess that's that's what started that this whole you know creation or this energy or whatever you want to call it. And when you began playing in in and around your neighborhood and everything did you play drums or were you interested more in percussion what was it that kind of drove you and what did you prefer? Well my first introduction to, to, to actual music was a drum corps, mm -hmm. right? And, and there was a drum and bugle corps in Jamaica called um, St. Peter Claver Drum Corps. And um, that's where I, I actually started because I used to walk by this, this church. It, it was kind of a, it's a church and, and a school also. But I used to walk past that, that place to go to school and back. So. I would hear the music playing, but every time I would go there, the gate, the gate was closed, so you can't go in. That, you know, I'd be coming from school and hearing the music and the drums and the bugles and stuff like that. And I heard it and I would pass by, oh, I can't get in there, so okay. So I kept going through that for a while. And just this one day, I was, I, I'll never forget, I was 11 years old. And I needed something because remember, I didn't grow up with a dad and all that kind of stuff. So in a weird kind of way, I needed to be around something that would give me some kind of discipline. Sure. I didn't realize I was actually doing that, but that's what happened. So I said, I want to get in this drum corps. So I was passing by coming from school one evening and I said, let me go over this place. I'm going over here today, you know? So I went and the gate was open. I said, oh, look at this. <laughs> So I walked right in and, <laughs> and the day I walked in, it, listen to this, the day I walked in, they were recruiting new people. Oh, perfect serendipity. <laughs> you See what I'm saying? I just, I, I said, I'm going, I'm getting, I was in my mind, I was like, without even thinking, 
I'm getting in this place today. That, that was the feeling. <laughs> and I went and the gate was wide open, went in. They were recruiting new people. I said, okay. So I said, sign me up. I want to join, you know? <laughs> so I went in and they signed me up and stuff. And I started out in um, being a rifle bearer and flag bearer and all that kind of stuff. You know the drum court thing, you know? Yeah. You know, so I was a rifle, I was a rifle bearer, um, flag bearer and all that kind of stuff. So I did that for, you know, that, that was my initiation kind of vibe. So I did that. And then there were two groups. There were, there were a junior, a junior section and a senior section. So of course I started in the, in the junior section. So after maybe a couple of weeks, um, the older guys, some guys were leaving the, um, the senior band, you know, they, they're moving on to other things. So they needed new recruit to train for this, for the seniors. So I'm there and in this long line, standing at attention or whatever. And the instructor he came around and started picking people. You stand over there. You stand over there. So I'm standing there like, oh, are they going to pick me? Because <laughs> I wanted to be in the, in the senior band because that's where all the real happening was, you know. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm standing there at attention, you know. It was kind of like a military kind of thing. So I'm standing there and I'm praying. I want to be in that band, you know. So the guy passed me by, you know, like he was playing games with me, you know. I'm like, <laughs> you passed me Tell that guy, uh, what's going on? So it came down to a few people. But I, I kind of figured it was playing in my head, you know, like to see, to see how I would react. So I, I, still, I still stood firm, and you know what I mean? And I guess they're looking for I look, I guess they're looking for that kind of determination. I didn't flinch. I was like, okay, I'm just going to stand here, you know? So, and he came. Davis, go over there. Uh, what? How can I, huh? I said, yeah, go over. So I went over, and I was happy. And then they started training me to play the snare drums. Okay, you know, back then it would, you play one drum at a time. So, so I was playing the snare drums and they, they taught me the rudiments and, and that's where it all started. And then I ended up in, once in the drum corps, um, I spent like six years in the drum corps, right? And I went from playing the snare drum to what they call the tenor drum, the big bass drum, cymbals, right? Check that out. So I'm playing what is now a regular drum kit. But I started out playing each piece here separately, not <laughs> even realizing that there was something in the works. I'm going to end up playing a trap set, which, which consists of all those pieces, the snare, yeah. the kick, the toms, which they call a tenor drum, but they, it, you play the toms and the cymbals. <laughs> so, you know, it, it just, it just kind of like, just like you say, it just worked out without me even realizing because I didn't really, I mean, when I was a kid, my first, you know, thought that came through me was to join the military. You oh, know? really? When I, yeah, wow. I said, I, yeah, if, it's if I if I came to America, like with that during that time, when I was of age, I would I would I would have I would have been I would have served in the military, because that was my first thing. I, maybe I wouldn't be a musician like playing. Maybe I would. I don't know. You know, cause you don't you can't think that far back and say well yeah. what you would have done. But my first dreams and aspiration was to be in the military. Wow. That was my first dream. Not me. Not playing. Not playing music. You must like discipline. <laughs> no, 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 because... <laughs> because it, it takes all that, though. I, I was talking to MB Gordy in one of the interviews, and I asked him that question about discipline, and I was thinking of that today, earlier before this interview, and I was thinking, it must be extraordinary. You have to practice. You have to be consistently on top of it to, to hold that and continue to grow. I mean, you had to discipline. Yes, because, look, Growing up in Jamaica, right? You know, I grew up in tough, a tough part of the, of the city. I mean, everywhere was like, but you grew up in the, what they would say, ghetto. But it wasn't ghetto. It was like just regular, regular, regular nice people, nice homes, everybody, everything was okay. But you had elements of rude people. I had friends 
who would do stuff that I didn't approve of, you know? Mm -hmm. They would want to go steal something over here and do that. And I was like, no, because I grew up with my mom and she was my disciplinarian. You know, she was a, a, a but a woman can't really do what a man can do. But, but, but my mom did a lot. She would <laughs> whoop my ass if I get out of line. Trust me. She would give me that strap. That's what it was. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that she did that. But growing up and seeing all what was going on, all the wrong stuff that was happening, guys stealing stuff, guys going to jail, and I was like, hmm, I don't want to go down that road. I don't think that road is where I want to go. So, and it's weird because people say, oh, a, a child 11 years old don't know what's going on, da, 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 da. Wait a minute. I was 11 years old, and I made a decision that, look, I needed to be somewhere after school to keep my head in a, in a positive direction. Now, mm -hmm. at 11 years old, oh, I'm talking to you about that. I wasn't even thinking that, but somewhere it was there. I needed that, that certain thing that can keep me straight. And, and that's the way I, I am today, because just like you say, to, to, play, to play an instrument, you have to be disciplined. Yeah. You know, it's, if you're playing by yourself, you can do all kind of crap, whatever. But when you're playing with a group of people, then you realize that you have to be mindful of the guy to your left, the guy to your right, the guy behind you, the guy in front of you. So I figured more or less that's what I needed. You know, and I'm very thankful that I made that decision, that it was in me. Because who knows? I could have been a criminal. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I could have been dead, you know? So, but I'm glad that I, I made a decision that, look, I'm not going to jail. I'm not going to be a criminal. I'm not going to be a menace to society. I'm not going to, I want to, I think what was in me, because I grew up in the church, so maybe that's part of it too. I, I, was, I was always a God-fearing person because my mom, she reads her Bible. She's always praying. So come on, I grew up in that. So how am I going to move away from that and go do something stupid. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, you have so, to stay into so, your groove. And, and... Right. Mm -hmm. So I, ma I made that decision. And, 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 and just like I said, never, I had a couple of stepfathers, but they were like, I don't want to call them names, but they were, they were. They weren't they good were, examples of what you needed. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the drum, the drum corps is what did that to me. And that's, that's what's, what, what, Build me up. Now, when you were mind. you when you went to church when you were younger, um, what kind of music was in your church? What what style was it there? It was it it was mainly hymns, like church hymns, like the stuff that you know. And then the lady on the keyboard or the or the organ or the piano, they were you know, and it would be just regular churchy. The, 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 those hymns Jamaican that they style or I don't know, no, no, just regular because you know okay. most of most of the the church songs were like global international okay. thing that you would hear in many church. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, Jesus love me. Yeah. Yes, Jesus. the Bible tell me so. So, so you kind of gospelly, kind of. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I grew up hearing that and enjoyed it. Even to this day, I en I enjoy gospel music because. Yeah. It, it does something to you. It, it may, you know, and that's why that, you know. Moves you in your heart. Yes. I, I think, yeah. Because music for me is very spiritual. Mm -hmm. My music, the way I think of music, it's spiritual because it's, it, it, it has to be, to me, it has to be something uplifting. Mm -hmm. If it's not uplifting, I don't want to do it. I don't, you know, I, I don't want to. I love that. Yeah. Good for you. Like, I don't want to be, I've never, want, I've never wanted to involve myself in music that tears down. Mm -hmm. I want to be involved in projects, musical projects, whatever that lifts up, you know? So when you hear it, you feel good. You feel like, okay, I can go somewhere with this. And you felt that way when you joined the Whalers? When you, when you got into working that way? Was well, it? okay, so I wasn't, I, I wasn't a full member of the Whalers, Whalers group. It was just session, session stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. But when you go around those people, Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, Bonnie Whalers, 
you felt that energy. Because these brothers, they were spiritual people. They, their music was coming from that place. Yeah, it so, chills as you say that. <laughs> yeah, but no, I'm telling you. Yeah. So when, you, when you're in their presence, you feel that. Yeah. You, feel, you feel that energy. So you had to fall in, <laughs> you know? You, if, if, if you come around those guys with your little ego and your little self, this or whatever, you're not going to fit in, you know? You're going to miss it, really. It's actually something you catch, right? It's, some, yes, it's something yes. you avail yourself to. So you're exactly. opening to it, right? Yeah, it's like, it's like the whole saying, uh, you are what you eat, you know? So, you're right, yes. yes. <laughs> so, so when you're around good people, when you're around good people with good energy, you, bec you become part of that easy. Well, what's one of your favorite spiritual experiences that really moved you in your life around music? You've been all over the world. You've traveled everywhere. You've been through all these, you know, both important and yet even dangerous situations. What's a spiritual moment that you just said, wow, and it never left you? Okay. There, oh, what happened? I'm here. I'm um, here. For some weird reason, um, my thing, my it went back to the to the join me page kind of thing. What's happened? Oh, it just might be another another pop up window on top. Yeah, I mean, I see yeah. you. I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, but it's like... my thing. I can't see you. What the hell? <laughs> I'll pop yeah. Okay, so there have been many spiritual moments for me. And the time I felt that was when I worked with Peter Tosh. Because, you know, I didn't realize, well, I realized after a while, but at, at the time, I didn't realize we were actually ministering to people. Mm -hmm. And there, will be, there were many a times I remember this one time, this person came up to me after, finish, after we finished a, a show. The show was great. I don't remember if it was, if it was a, well, there was a couple of times. And this person came to me and said, they were on the verge of committing, com committing suicide. Wow. And somebody told them about the Peter Tosh concert. And they say, oh, well, if I'm going to go out, let me just enjoy myself and then I'm going to do what I'm going to do. This, is, this, this wow. person is talking to me and I'm standing there listening. I didn't say nothing. I was, I was like listening. And I think, I think, it, was a, I think it was a lady or a, I, I don't quite remember because it's been so long. But I remember, I remember, I remember the conversation and the person said to me, they came to the concert just as a regular concert. And at the end of the concert, I think, it was, I think it was a lady. She said, I was changed. She said, something happened. And now yeah. she realized she came to the concert for a reason because it, it totally changed all that thought processing that she had about committing suicide. Beautiful. That's what music does, and that's what it's about. Whether you see it, you're not trying to, it just happens. Yeah, I, I've seen people come and cry tears, bawling, bawling about what just happened to them coming to the concert. So I think, you know, those were some of the more spiritual moments where I realized that I actually got feedback from, from people. And, you know, and many a time people would come to me, you know, but during that time, it was different because people would always just find me and just try to let me know how they feel and what we just did to them and whatever, you know, so that was, what, I mean, there have been many other times after that, but during the Peter Tosh time, that was when I actually felt it, you know. Mm -hmm. When and, you were playing live with Peter Tosh, when, just go back into a moment there and you're playing live and you, you can see the audience, you can feel it, you're in it. Explain that feeling. That, okay. So just to, just to um, involve that in the spiritual experience. I can remember something happened one day. I was playing 
but I didn't realize that I kind of went off in a trance where I'm playing, but I'm not, it's like spiritually, I'm like somewhere else. Yeah. I'm playing. And this, this guy is telling me what he saw. So I'm playing and I'm, I'm like in the groove, I'm playing so hard and my stick, the drumstick, I hit the drum, the, the, the stick went up into the air. And the guy's telling me that would help me even looking. I put my hand up and catch the stick. The <laughs> stick, the stick went up, I'm playing. And in the midst of playing, I hit, the stick flew up in the air. And he said, he looked at me. I didn't look up. I just put my hand up and catch the stick and continue playing. Unbelievable. And he's telling me, I said, well, did I do that? He said, yeah, you did. <laughs> man, man, that was some great stuff, man. I, he, you, you played on the stick, well, you just, you without looking, you grab the stick. I said, really? I was really conscious. When he's, he's trying to explain the moment to me, I was like, I don't remember that. Spirit did it. You were in spirit and spirit did it for you. And, and exactly. actually so, kept all of that in time. <laughs> right. So, you know, there is so, and, and, and there's numerous times where things would happen. You know, I would do things, not even realize I did it. And people would tell me after the fact, well, man, man, you were great. I said, great about what? Man, that thing you just did. I said, what? <laughs> it happened a couple of times. You don't even remember it. You're like Unex unexplained, <laughs> unexplained mysteries. <laughs> You're, you, well, you do become a channel as a musician if you let go into it. And then the beauty of some of the best music ever made is the coherency of all the musicians doing that simultaneously. And then right. it just happens, right? Right. Well, you see, just like I said, music is a very inward thing it's it's not it, and then okay you it's it's also floating around because that bob marley said the natural mystic blowing through the air so if you listen carefully you'll hear it right but it's deep it's it's a musician cannot lie yeah this is why i i love listening to instrumental music because mm -hmm. i would say okay people can write lyrics and sing some stuff but they might not really believe it. They might say, oh, I love and hope togetherness. But then they go around the corner and say, oh, I hate that person's guts. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But a guy who's playing a saxophone or a trumpet or a piano, that person is, can't lie. Whatever, whatever emotions, whatever feeling that person have, they play. So if that person is sad, they're going to play some sad licks. Yeah. If, they, if that person is joyful, they're going to play a joyful licks or whatever, whatever the combination of, the, of expression that they have is going to come out, you know? Mm -hmm. So music in itself to me is highly spiritual. And, you know, when you look at, um, I was watching a, a documentary uh, a couple of weeks ago. First time I ever saw a, 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 anything about Coltrane. Because I, I, I love Coltrane's music. And just to come to the point where this guy was deeply spiritual. He, 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 he viewed his music from a, a different... He, he went through a lot of stuff. But a lot of these musicians, they're seeing things that you can't... that normal people can't see. Only other musicians can say. But, but then they would interpret it different. Oh, he's crazy. He, he acts kind of weird. Right, right. But they don't, because they don't understand. It's the fear. Right. You know, these guys, you check all of these great musicians. Like, I can, I can pull up some, yeah. I can pull up some names like Rassan, Roland Kirk, you know. This guy will be playing two horns at the same time. And, you know, all these great players. Carlos Santana, he, the, the things he, he would do is out of this world. It's kind of like, wait a minute, you know. So all these great musicians, you know, they're, they're on a different level. They're, they're, they're wavelength, their musical wavelength is like way out there somewhere. It's not just, oh, I went to school and I learned the rudiments and I can, the basic and I can play. No, it's, it's deeper than that, you know? So for me, music, and, and that's my 
that's my approach to the thing, you know? It's your church, really. You're it's my church, yeah. exactly. Because when I play, <laughs> I would I would be humming to myself, even in a different tune, even though I'm playing the song on stage. <laughs> no, it's weird, but I'm humming. I don't know, it just happens. And it's something, if I tell people this, they would say, how can you be humming a different song but you're playing it? I said, well, guess what? It's some kind of, and most musicians, if you, if you listen, a lot of drummers or, or bass players, like in the, a lot of those jazz bands, you hear them doing like grunt, like, mm, 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 and they be doing these things, and you're like, what's wrong with him? But no, <laughs> no, to, you know, to the honor, you know, who don't understand the emotions, the, the, the vibe, right. yeah. that, you know, it's something that is, you know, it's deep. It's, it's, it can't be explained, really, you know? Because people say, can you explain that? No. Can you You have to experience it? it. You can't even explain a studio session there, until you experience it. There you go. You have to experience it. Yeah, okay. and the best way to experience it is to try it on for yourself. Because I believe all people, you know, people used to say to me, I can't sing, I can't sing. And I say, that's not true. You just don't know how to breathe. And when you let go and you learn to breathe, you can sing. There you and go. Yeah. All sound is good. Like my first vocal teacher told me, he said, if all the birds in the forest sounded the same, we wouldn't have harmony. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he exactly. was encouraging me, go through what you go through to get to the, get what you need to get out of it. Just keep right. working at it. And, yes. you know, the beauty of musicians, I think, is that not only do they learn how to team play, most of the time. Most musicians are humble. They, they learn how to team play, but it's always mm -hmm. a personal best and then a team best. Yes. Working yes. for the team. And that is how the world should go. I think, you know, instead of war, we should have musical playoffs. Right. But, <laughs> but, but, but here's the thing, you know, people would come to me and say, man, man, you're a great drummer and you're this and that. And I'm like, look, okay, I appreciate the the comments or the compliments or whatever, but I would I would be nothing without the other guys. Yeah, it's a because synergy, isn't it? I I I consider myself. I always consider myself a part of. I want to be a part of something, you know. Because, okay, I do what I do, and people say I'm great or whatever. But you are. I know that I'm not that great as to. I'm the great, like, like people would say things, man, you're the greatest reggae drummer, you're the greatest that. I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just a link in the chain. You're working I'm just one of the links. I'm not the, I'm not the chain. I'm, I'm just one of the guys, and I'm not the greatest. Because there are a lot of drummers out there who can do things I can never do. I'm like, whoa, what is that? You know? But I do what I do, and I do it with a passion, and I love what I do. That's it. Nope. It's passion. You know, that is, yeah. I think that's the other component to the spiritual commentary, mm -hmm. the passion that you yeah. bring to the table and in showing up is 99% of it to show right. up like you did as a kid, you went through the open door and the open gate and you showed up and you then right. said, I'm staying with it. I'm going to keep showing yes. up. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's the way I am. What, whatever I do, if I, if I'm your friend, I'm going to be your friend. You know what I mean? It, it, it's not like, yeah, I'm your friend sometimes. No. I put my old self, and I guess that is part of me growing up alone, because I didn't have no brothers, no sisters. So I learned to internalize, you know? So I say, if I'm doing something, I have to believe it, you know? So I have to yeah. believe it first. So if I'm going to be your friend, I'm going to be your friend. Until, until, you, until you start messing up, I'm like, really? You're going to do me that? After I'm giving... <laughs> I'm giving you a hundred, but you just give me seventy-five. Oh, yeah. man, come on! You know, so I'm I'm that type of person. I'm you know I'm in a band. I'm in a band. I'm playing music. I'm gonna play, and, and I'm I'm gonna play like my life life de depends on. You know what I mean? So that's the kind of person I am. You know. Do you have a particular style or sound that you like most that actually feels good to you? You have a time signature or a or a, a rhythm that is yours. You know, like when I sing, I have a certain sound, and every when I need to go back to kind of feel me, I go back to that sound that I create. 
You know what? I wouldn't say I I I I, I don't have a style of I'd have a preference. Because here I look at it now. I look at it that whenever I enter into a situation, that's where I pick up on what's happening. So you're present. If, yeah. It, whatever. Okay. So I would deal with 10 different people, 10 different sessions. And when I go to that session, I don't go with, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do today. When I go in the studio, or to the venue or whatever, you know? I listen to what the music is saying to me at the moment. Like, like people would ask me that, what's your style? What's I said, I don't really have one because if, if I create that persona of, okay, this is how I do things, then I won't evolve because I would always be approaching every song the same way without say wait a minute every song every project have its own um essence its own um energy yeah. attitude its own energy so what i do when i go in a studio or wherever i start listening to what is there and then i apply whatever it's asking me for you beautiful. know yeah that's and beautiful i mean it's yeah that that's the only way i can explain it I have never tried to, to approach something like, okay, well, this is a Santa Davis style or this particular thing is something, you know what I mean? I mean, don't get me wrong. There is that certain thing about you that you, that you tap into. Yeah. But, it's, but, it's, but, but it's, it's, actually, it's a spiritual thing again, you know? But when it comes to dealing with things outside of my spectrum, I try to approach it for what it is. Not going there thinking, oh, well, I'm going to do this session today. And this, today I'm going to do like this and I'm going to use this. No. If it called for, okay, wait a minute. This song is a 6-8. Six, eight. Oh, 6-8. All right, cool. You know, or the guy said, you know, I want to start the song with a 6-8 or a 7-4 or whatever intro. I'm like, okay, all right. I was expecting that, but that's what he want. So now I got to figure out. And sometimes it's not even figuring it out too, because I would do I would do stuff for people sometimes, and I go to the studio and start playing, and then they have I'm playing, and then here comes maybe sixteen bars in, there's a push, and for some weird reason I feel this push, and I push also, and, and then when everything is done, they're like, wait a minute. How come you know we were going to do that? Because they they weren't they just say okay just come play some drum, we just give us the Santa Davis thing, but they don't realize no 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 no, I'm not coming with the Santa Davis thing, yeah. I'm coming there to represent what that project is, what that music is, and you know, with the help of the spirits, I want to feel where it's where it's going. So I I humble myself. That's the first thing. Once I walk through that door, I don't come in there like, yeah, I'm Santa Davis here. I, okay. This, you know, no. <laughs> I come in there and I start trying to be a part, a part of what's happening. That, that, that's just me. And I would do things that are like, man, how come you're doing all that? That's exactly what we wanted. I said, there you go. <laughs> you know? But yeah. it's, just, it's just that yeah. thing of being humble. You have to be. And yeah. then what, once you humble yourself, then that energy will become you, you know, you, and you become the energy, you know? So. And doesn't, don't you think that your confidence grows as naturally as you do that? Because you become yes. confident in the intuitive kind of yes. feel to what you're doing, and then you don't question anymore. So you can do that at that level. Exactly, because like I tell people, you know, you have a lot of different, um, you have different types of people. You have some people who think that, you know, they are all that and this can't work without them. But I tell people this, it's not about me. Yeah. It has never been about me. You know, I, I played on some, I played on a couple of hit records, I played on a couple of Grammy nominated and Grammy winning, uh, you know, projects. But it was never about me because I, I wasn't the only one who was playing. 
Yeah. You know, I'm part of, I'm a part of what's happening. So it's never about me. It will never be about me. Wasn't it fun to get to be a part of that? I mean, look at your life and what you've done. It's so exciting. If you look back I, over what you've done, it's amazing. But of course, but the thing is, is I never realized that that would happen. Yeah. I was just like, okay, just like when I was in the drum corps, I was part of a group of 50 people or 60 people, right? So it wasn't about individual stardom or whatever, you know? You move to the right, you move to the right, you move to the right, you move to the... So it was just one unit. So I consider myself a part of a unit. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I never expected that, you know, people would be like, oh man, Sana, I, I love what you do and oh, you inspire me. I'm like, what? I'm like, you know, sometimes even after somebody would say that to me, oh man, I bought my first drum kit because of you. I started, I started playing music because the first time I saw you, I'm like, what? But that's cool because at least I'm influencing in yeah. the right direction. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're contributing. Your oh, yeah. Good, yeah. And I think it's your example. If you really look at it that way, it's really more about the example of what we've been talking about that you bring to the table, being available, walking in humble, being a team player, being open to spirit and letting it guide you which yeah. makes it so much easier on everybody in a session, yeah? <laughs> right, right. Because when you come in to a situation with your little attitude, you immediately start messing with the vibe. Yeah. Yeah, you can't do that. And it never, <laughs> it never ever works out good. It's going to be a wreck. Yeah. It's going to be a train wreck. Because, you know, and, and I've seen that. I've seen guys, you know, the moment you see them, that's why... When it comes to celebrities, I don't, I don't run up to these people no more because I remember this one time, I, don't, I won't call a name, but I remember I was um, up in Santa Monica where, where we used to do the stairs. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh -huh. and, I, saw, and I saw this, this actor, you know. So, you know, you see, you see somebody, you look at them and you acknowledge, hey, you know, you know. And I, I looked at this guy and I was acknowledging him like, hey, you know. And he was looking, looking back, like, what the F are you looking at? You know, like, oh, no. I'm just there, just acknowledging that, hey, brother, you know? Uh, he looked at me the weirdest way. And I was like, wow. Here I am, just, I'm not trying to ask for something. I'm just acknowledging. I see yeah. you, I give you a nod, a smile. And so what I'm saying is, a lot of people, they have this type of attitude where, you know, they show up, they're like, yeah, you know who I am? I hate when people say that. You know who I am? Who are you? <laughs> You're somebody you know? not in touch with your spirit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who are you? I mean, so you're what? I mean, did you did you create um did you invent the wheel or something? Or, you yeah. know? Or did you create air? You know? What did you do? Who are you? So that type of vibe, you know, I'm not oh. into that. And that's why mm -hmm. I keep saying. It's not about me. It's about what we are doing, us, the energy, the vibration, the spirit, you know? Yeah, I and love that. I, yeah, Thank you for talking about this with me today because I really love this very conversation is what my audience especially is so geared to. They, they believe in that and they are looking for that. I believe it's a kind of sincere energy. It's sincerity. And yeah. We're lacking a lot of that in today's world, but let's go back to your days with Peter Tosh because it ended in tragedy and you survived and you are very courageous and you've been, you know, you really went through it in that. But when you began playing with him and working with him, what was that like for you on a musical level and on a personal development level? A dream come true. <laughs> you know, because, you know, I first um, met the Whalers when, they were, when it was all three of them together. And I worked with them in the studios, right? And that, my first introduction was like, wow, you know, I grew up, I grew up hearing these guys, you know, listening to their music. And now here I am in the studio with three of Jamaica's giants, you know, yeah. in the business. I was like, whoa, 
It's like is playing with the Beatles. <laughs> like you said, people say, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the, yeah, they were my Beatles, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like pinching, you know, they say, pinch yourself, is this real? I'm in the studio with the wailing, the wailing wailers. Not the wailers, the wailing wailers. That's what, that's what, who they were at that time. And then I worked, I started my thing, and this was like in 72, I think, 72, 73. And that's when my, my relationship started. And these guys were already big and their energy was there. So that was my first introduction. Then I, along the way, I started to work with them individually. So I worked with Bob individually on projects, Bonnie Whalers individually, and Peter Tosh. And I did one, I only did one live show with Bob, mm -hmm. one live show. It was for a, a memorial for a guy who had passed away and they wanted to do a memorial, a little tribute, you know, set. So we did, I did that with him. Then did I, Bob ever give you a word of wisdom that you never forgot? Did he ever say something to you that stuck with you? Bob Marley. I had great conversations with Bob. I didn't tell, I never tell people this because people might, oh, yeah, you just want to, no. No, no, I want to hear I that. remember, I remember one time I was at, I was at his studio one night. We were there recording, you know, because we used to do a lot of work at the, at the Tough Gang studio where they call it the museum right now. And, you know, we were outside sitting on the steps, right? And he came out and he's like, hey, what's going on? I mean, man just hanging out just making music and we were having this conversation and for some reason me and him got into this deep conversation start talking about creativity and energy and whatever and i don't know how it started but he said to me part of the conversation was you know what you know you play drums and i play guitar and sing i can't tell you i can't tell you how to play your drums. And you can't tell me how to play my guitar and sing because that's what you do. You play drums. How, how, how am I going to tell you as a trained drummer how to play your drums? Right. I just allow you. And that stuck with me because I realized that's the reason why Bob Marley's music is so widespread because he allowed things to happen. And I learned from that, like great music always come from great people who allowed he said look you you're a drummer that's what you do if you don't cut it if, if you if you don't live up to the standard of your what you say you do then that's your problem you're gonna be cast out but if if, if you know what you're doing then good you play keyboards that's what you do i can't tell a keyboard player how to play his keyboard because i'm not a keyboard player i have to just maybe i might have an idea oh can you play diddly diddly? okay cool but I still can't tell him how to execute it. I can only give an int as to maybe, but I can't come over and show him that. But what Bob did, he energized in me that the reason why is music and, and good music always come out of just jamming, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, you hear talk about jamming, I wanna jam it, because that's what Bob does. He would just play and you just fall in, you know? Yeah. Because, and, and you know, I. I just learned that, so I, I just learned a lot. I mean, to get into it before we move away from Bob, just to show you how it manifested like that. So I remember one day, um, I came by the studio. So I came by the studio, I was looking for somebody in the studio. So I came in and I opened the door. I opened the studio door, I went inside the control room. I was in the control room and he was in the studio with um, Family Man, Tyrone Downey, and I forget what else. But um, their main drummer wasn't there, Carl Barrett. Carlton Barrett wasn't there. So they were trying to make a song. And the song was coming in from the cold, right? <laughs> so I came through the door and I was looking through the, through the glass in the studio and he saw me and he said, hey, hey, lock the door, don't make that man leave. <laughs> Lock the door, don't make that man leave. Awesome. I didn't say, Santa, come inside here. So I went inside. I said, okay, whatever else I had to do, got to wait because I'm not going to say no to Bob Marley. Are you crazy? So I went inside the studio and they were glad because, you know, then people switched back, 
family man went to his base because I think he was doing something else. Family man went back to his base and Tyrone Downey, Downey went to the keyboards, right? And he said, okay, this is how I'm going to start the song. You know the rest of the history of uh, uh, um, coming in from the cold start, right? With that guitar thing. And I stood there and he played it. This is how I'm going to start the song. I said, okay. So I went inside the drum booth. And that song is one take. Wow. The really? first take. Oh, God. So I went inside the, inside, the, inside the drum booth and he started playing that thing. Ten ang ang ang. Ten ang ang ang. Ten ang ang. Ten ang ang. How did I come up with that? I don't know. <laughs> you were inspired. <laughs> right, but this, this is what I'm saying. Things happen like spontaneously. People like Bob Marley, you go in the studio with Bob Marley, there's a certain energy that you cannot resist. There was an energy, and, and that's, that's the way how it is. They didn't say, oh, that's, that role is too long or whatever. They were like, that's what the song is. That's what came up. That's what it is. Ten hits. I do doom, 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 ding, ding, doom, doom, bam, and, and the song was that. And, and then I didn't realize the significance of that song. It's years later. I was listening to a um, interview that Neville Garrick was doing. That Neville Garrick was his um his graphic artist, the guy that created those album covers and all that. Cool. Yeah. And he was saying because Bob had left Jamaica and went in exile for a while because I don't know if you remember there was an incident where they came and shoot up his shot mm -hmm. up his studio and all that, and he was like, "Hey, you know what? I'm getting out of here for a while." It, you know, there was some weird, weird stuff going on. And he went away to England. And he had just came back from England. That was one of his first songs, his reintroduction back into J the Jamaican Ooh. music community. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I played on the first song, yeah. right? Coming in from that, and the song was, you know, related to him coming in from the cold, coming right. from England. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize till maybe two years ago. <laughs> yeah. And, and I did I did that song in the in the late 70s. Oh my two God. years or three years ago, maybe two years ago, I learned that I played, I realized that I played on a song that Baba just came back from England, and that was the first song he's doing coming well, back from England. That's and kind I was of a, like, a long-standing gift for you. Yeah, man. So, you know, I just consider all of that an honor, a privilege, and just, you know, that is so I can't beautiful. explain it in words, but I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciative of being involved in stuff like that, you know? That is a beautiful story. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it gave me chills as you were telling me the story. Yeah, actually man. yeah you know that's the testimony to what we're talking about today it is being mm -hmm. present and in spirit so when you moved on and and worked with peter what was the difference and what was the vibe there well peter was on a mission you see peter tosh went through a lot of hardships you know and he would see he felt he felt abuse he felt um, he was a recipient of mistreatment, you know what I mean? Because he was, he smoked his herb and stuff like that. He, he didn't sell weed. Peter wasn't a, a drug dealer. He just smoked his weed, you know? And also, you know, all the indiscretions that people had to go through, the hardships, the injustices and stuff, he went through that. And he saw that. So here he is, a person who find himself having a voice and say, you know what? I'm going to use this voice for the people. You know? Mm -hmm. I'm, I have this platform, so I'm going to stand up and, and, and talk about it. I'm going to bring awareness to it. 
So when I got with Peter, you know, I, I was like, yeah, you know, because just like I said earlier, I, w I always wanted to, wanted to be involved with, with something that is uplifting, that's informational, that's driving, you, you know, the cutting edge then, you know? So when I got with Peter, I said, you know what? This is the type of group I want to be in. I want to be with, with something that's going to do service, you know, like spread good, positive messages, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, starting from, starting on that, that level to me was like the greatest honor. It was like, a, just like I said, dream come true. You know, so that was really a great start because he wasn't a guy who just wrote lyrics. He didn't just sit down. It's, it, it was real, real time happening. You know, so he was feeling it too. He was kind feeling of, kind of it, channeling the the messages that he wanted to bring forth to the world. Right. So that that was the one of the main main thing that that I really appreciated when what I started. What did you learn from that? Did you did you take away something in particular from that? Um, I learned I learned about commitment, commitment to 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 the cause. You know. Beautiful. Commitment to, to um, to doing the right thing. You know, and sometimes you, you might not be liked. You know, you might be ostracized or whatever. You might be condemned, but you have to be, as as Ziggy said, true to yourself, and just be. If you're going, if you if you be true to yourself, then you, then whatever you do. To the people would be true to the people because you have to speak truth you know for, yeah. for what it is and it doesn't matter so i learned that you have to just be committed man let's be committed to doing the right thing you know no matter the cost <laughs> i love that i love that we've we've hit on discipline we've hit on uh allowing and honor and truth and commitment I, yes I, this is you are a walking embodiment of your belief system and of your passion and and your well your commitment to spirit honestly but I'm, I'm still learning because you know i i would be lying if i sit here like oh i'm mr perfect and i'm like no i'm still no <laughs> what aren't you perfect with <laughs> right right you know i'm <laughs> <That's> sorry <laughs> i'm still learning i'm still i'm still open to learning something because it's funny every day i would learn something new you know it, it, it's it, it's it's just that you know and to me, that's the exciting part to me yeah. about living and yeah. being in this business. Because the moment you think you know everything, that's when you start to fail, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I'm just still on that, that trend, on that track, learning. I'm, I'm, I'm wide open, like, hey, you know, I'm not Mr. Know-it-all, you know? I'm still, I'm still practicing. I'm still figuring out stuff on my instrument like wait a minute how do i get this so it can be effective or more effective be more effective you know how can i do better you know so it's just a constant um learning curve you know i love it i i love what we're talking about today and i'm so grateful that you've come to share now yeah. when you you were with um peter and you it ended in a, in a way that was very tragic and you're very lucky. You're fortunate to be here today. Can you talk about that a little bit? Cause not everybody knows that story. Um, you know what, man, the tragedy of it all is that a good person lost his life because he was kind. Peter lost his life because he was trying to help. And if you listen on his last album, um, No Nuclear War, he's got he, he has a song about he um about about the, 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 the about learning lessons in his life. Right? Um I forgot the what's the name of the song itself. I don't know. But but he said, I've learned some lessons in my life. Lessons in my life. He said, you know, they will make promises. To you today and tomorrow they change their mind that was part of the song and he's talking about money make friendship ends 
it makes friendship end. And that was like to me, when I heard when I hear songs like that, that was his last album. I'm like, wow, wait a minute, you know? This this was kind of like he saw it. Like he mm -hmm. saw it coming without even being able to explain it, you know? Yeah. And that's that's how, that's how he died. He died because of someone else's greed, you know? But um, you know, the tragedy, the, the, the big tragedy is that three people died. Peter Tosh and a brother named Doc, and and the other brother, his name is Free Eye. Free Eye, you know, all three per people, they were friends of mine, you know? And regardless of what you might hear, Peter Tosh died beside me. Whatever they say, he died in the hospital. That was just reflexes because he had already passed away. Uh. But, but if you ask any doctor, they would say, yeah, when somebody died, but you know, maybe minutes later, they still have some signs of life in them. And that's sometimes the doctors sometimes say, okay, let's try and save this person, you know? Mm -hmm. But Peter died tragically, you know? I don't want to go into all the details, but you know, it, 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 it was just something where, you know, the 11th of September, what, two days ago? Yeah, two days ago. And every, every 11th of September, it comes back. But I've never forgotten about Peter because I have a picture of Peter on my wall right here. I, have, I, have a, I don't know if I can show it. Let me see. So over here, uh, oh, see yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. and then I have a picture of Bob Marley over here. <laughs> Reflecting back and forth to each other. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, uh -huh. so, so I, have, I have those two, um, plug my stuff back in. I have those two angels watching over me, you know? <laughs> so, you know, but it's just, you remember, you know, and it's not good memory, but I try to look at it like, you know what? He died an innocent human being. He died because of the type of person he was, you know? And it was senseless, you know? And there was a lot of things that happened, man. You know, it's like, at, at one point, the people were even trying to blame me. They were trying to blame me that, oh, they, um, the argument was, I drove away and left them to die. No, uh, no, okay. Horrible. Right now, I'm still walking with a bullet in me. I have a bullet in me that I'm going to die with that bullet. It's still inside my body. Now, would I volunteer for something like that? Would anybody volunteer to be shot? I'm still walking with a projectile in my body, right? And, you know, I survive because of God. Yeah. Because I'm going to let you know this. When the incident happened, and after the guys left, whatever, they thought we were all dead, and they left, when I got up, I couldn't feel my left side. I couldn't feel it. I was like, wait a minute. Did they shot? I couldn't feel my arm or anything. I was like, did they shoot my arm off? You know, because I couldn't feel it. And then in the same, in the same moment, I started feeling my, my, my breathing start getting weird. Remember, I'm a guy prior to that, that same morning, I would get up every day. I was like a, I was an exercise freak. <laughs> I would get up at five o'clock in the morning and where I lived, there was a lot of hills, hills and valleys. And me and, my, me and two of my friends, we get up every morning and I'm running up hills. I'm, I was a physically fit guy back then. Washboard stomach, not that now I got a little ball belly, but whatever. <laughs> but, you know, back then I was like Mr. F Mr. Fit, Mr. Fitty, Fitty, Fit. And to see that night, I'm now struggling to breathe. 
I'm like, wait a minute. This ain't right. And the only, when, when you're in a situation like that, only one thing come to you. I got to get to that place of recovery. I got to get out of here. Because, you know, you, you start panicking too, you know. Because you say, wait a minute. I'm not breathing right. This is not right. I can't feel my left side. And now my, my, my breathing is like I have to make effort to, to, to. So I don't know I did it. But I'd, I had a Jeep Cherokee. And it's a left hand, it's a left hand drive like, like what we drive here in America. I brought it down when I came. The first tour I did at Peter Tosh. The first tour, I brought a truck from, I bought it in Miami, shipped it to Jamaica. <laughs> that was my first tour. Anyway, so I've, 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 obviously it's a left-hand drive. So we drive on the, our driver's side is on the, the right, the right-hand side of the, the vehicle. So anyway, so I jumped. Luckily, it was, le it was a left-hand drive because then when I went in, I, I could only use my right hand. I drove myself to the hospital with just the, the last bit of energy that I had. Because when I got there, I was like out of it. I fell out of the vehicle, and luckily these guys were there, you know, the porters, and, and they put this gurney out, and they put me on the gurney, right? And took me right, right away into the emergency room. So I was there for, well, OK. So they examined me to see if there was an exit wound. And when they realized there wasn't an exit wound, they went into overdrive because they realized what was happening. I was drowning in my blood. And I even, I, I, I even said to, you know, I even said to the, to the doctors, please, man, take care of me. They said, don't worry about it, Mr. Davis. We're going to take care of you, right? Because I was panicking then, you know? And I, I was looking at them. You're laying down and see all these people around you, and they don't look so happy about what they're seeing. Oh, yeah. So I'm like, so I'm like, wait a minute. So I say, hey man. Now I start panicking. They said, don't worry, don't worry. We take, we take care of you. And they, they realized that I didn't have an exit wound, so they, they made an incision in, in my side. To drain the and, blood. And and they put a tube yeah. inside there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Put a tube, and they had this big like bottle with some fluid at the bottom and the, whatever, and and that that was in my that was in me for like about three four days, Ooh. right? Three four days. So I'm laying. Okay, so that you know, taken care of. So I'm there, and they brought Peter in. They brought Peter in, Peter and one other guy, cause one one guy died on the spot. Um, the guy we call Doc, he was one of those guys who make these energy drinks and stuff. And he, you know, so he, anyway, he passed away immediately and he, in the house. And, and they brought Peter in and they were trying to work on him, you know. These doctors, even though they know it was still a hopeless case, they know that. Because I don't want to get gory or anything. But they have but, to. They but, have the to man's, right? but the man's brain, Peter Tosh's brain, was left in the house, mm -hmm. right? And then people trying to blame me, saying that I, if I had stayed, I could have, you know, I was selfish. And this, uh, this kind of thing. I'm you saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do you tell somebody who is shot? How do you tell that person how to think or how to act? Yeah. You're not in a position to tell somebody who is shot or stabbed or whatever. And on top of that, you can feel one side of your body. Your breathing is messed up. And you're going to tell that person how they must act, what they must do. Walk in that person's shoes for a minute, and then you will understand. It's only then, when I got to the hospital, I realized how serious I was. They said my lungs. My lung, my lung collapsed to the size of a, a golf ball. That's what they said. That's what the doctor said to me after I recovered later on. They said, Mr. Davis, you were in, you were in bad shape. Mm. And then, so the next day, 
I'm lying on my bed and, you know, that was in the morning time. All the doctors came to work and surgeons or whatever. And they, they were doing the, you know, the walk around, checking patients out. So there was a group of doctors and nurses standing off to the side and they were talking, oh man, you know, you know, uh, Peter Tosh, they came in last night and he died and a couple of other people. And, they, and, and, they, and, then, and then I heard him say, oh, I heard um, one of the patients uh, drove themselves here, right? So I'm laying there hearing him talking about, I'm saying, wait, they don't know that it's me? That was me. So I said, hey, that was me. And one of the nurse, she said to me, oh no, Mr. Davis, you couldn't have done that, not the condition that, that you were in last night. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, no, that was me. She said, no, Mr. Davis. That's highly impossible. You could never have driven yourself here in the condition that you were in. And I'm saying, okay. <laughs> so maybe, <laughs> not maybe. <laughs> Got and, to you there. The angels were there yes. with me. I was oh, just yeah. in the vehicle. You know, and it, it's, 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 it's weird, you know. I see these things and this one guy, this one guy, out of listening to a lie from Peter Tosh's woman, cause she told a big lie on me. She, she went on an interview and she concocted this story and, and, and let it out to the people. They put it on YouTube. This one guy do a 27 minutes, 26, 27 minutes piece on me, talking about how wicked I am and how evil I am and I'm this and I'm that and with friends like that, who needs enemy? And this guy was going off on me, right? And I'm saying, wait a minute. Did you at least have the, the integrity to go and get some verification? Go to the hospital. Ask them my condition. You know, I'm still walking with a bullet in me. Mm -hmm. And you're going to say what I should have done. And then all these people making their little comments, oh, yeah, Sandra Davis is a wicked guy and he's evil and he, he left his friends to them. I'm like, wow. You know? And here you <laughs> lost everybody that was close to you. Your, was your immediate family and all of your, your, the people that you vested your soul in. Yes, my friend, Peter Tosh, my friend, my brethren. You know what? Peter Tosh was like the big brother I never had. Aww. He taught me a lot of stuff, you know? And then you think if I was in a position, if you say, for instance, I wasn't shot, I wasn't injured, would I have left them there? I wouldn't. I would be the first one to, yeah. I would lift Peter up myself. Because I was in that good a shape. If I wasn't injured, if it was just a, a flesh wound, ah, not life threatening, tied up, let's go. But that's their perception of the whole thing. They draw their own conclusion and everybody starts saying, oh, he's a scapegoat. Let's give him all that. He's a scapegoat. You know what I mean? Put all the, the blame on him. And I'm like, wow. And now I'm mourning the loss of my friend, my mentor, you know? Someone who I knew for years upon years who I've never had a problem with. There was never a day that went by that me and Peter had any kind of disagreement, never. That's In true. all the years I've known the whalers, I've never had a, there was never an angry moment. There was never angry words passed between any of us. And here it is, my friend, he died beside me. Mm -hmm. He died right there. But it was, a, it was just that, that reflex thing that, you know, that he died in the hospital. I was just few, Minutes after they brought him in, he just left. He said, I heard the doctor say, oh, I'm afraid Mr. Tosh has left us. Well, that's a good story for the, the public in the world, right? Yeah, and when I, you know, and when I heard that, it kind of got, it, it, to be honest with you, you didn't want to be, you know, they say, ah, oh, everything is in slow motion and you don't want to believe stuff. I didn't want to believe what I heard. What, what I heard. It, even, even to this day, I'm still trying to comprehend that feeling that I had because it was like, nah, come on, man. Peter Tosh can't die like that, you know? You know, when, I, when you really hear, when you heard it, you know? But then it's, it was only after that 
one of the cops, they came in when I was in the recovery room now. And he's the one that gave me all the information about what he saw when he went into the house. Because they were trying to ask me if I can identify any of the people. I was like, well, there's only one guy I really could identify. And it was a guy whose name was Lepo, Lepo Loban or whatever. He died like a year or two ago, whatever, you know, but he was the only person, honestly, that I could recognize, you know? And he was, the cop was saying to me, man, he said, I've never seen such a gory scene in a long time. And then he said to me, man, Peter Tosh had a will to live. I said, why you say that? He said, man, all of the man's brains is in the house. How the hell did he just, how the hell did he die in the hospital when his brains are on the floor? And that's when it came home to me like, wow, really? So that's how I knew that he died beside me right there. It was just reflex. Mm -hmm. It was just that old thing, you know, doctors will tell you that. I mean, I'm, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know much about that old science, but I heard them say, oh, you know, after the body dies, or after somebody dies, they still have a little thing going, you know? Yeah. So that, that was only then when, I, when, when the cop sh said to me that Peter Tosh had a will to live. Because how the hell did he die in the hospital when his brains are in the house? So he told me that. One of those cops, he's living right here in California right now. Really? You know? Yeah, he's living in California right now. Have you and ever talked to him? Oh, I talked to him. I talked to him, you know, quite frequently. Oh, and, wow. And, you know, it's funny that I wish that, that he could tell, say something. But you know what? I don't need any proof or any verification because I know the truth. Because when he's telling me this, all the lies that that woman told on me, and I, and I have people in the music community looking at me with, with dirty looks and, you know, writing stuff and thinking stuff. She didn't tell the people what she did. And the cop is telling me, okay, so when they went there, it was nighttime. So it was difficult. You know, Jamaica is not like America where you have all these, you know, forensics people who just jump and stuff, you know? You know, Jamaica was a little different. So they say, okay, they couldn't get the guys out to come and do forensics because it was dark with night. They wanted daylight so they can see stuff, you know? If it, it was... If we had cell phone back then, they would have taken pictures. But they had to wait for these other people to come. So they said they're going to leave the crime scene as it is until the next day. So he said, when they went back to the crime scene the next morning, he said the place was all cleaned up. What? All the, all the Somebody evidence. Somebody did that. Uh, Peter Tosh's woman. She went back, cleaned up the... It, the guy, the cop said to me that all the evidence, all the blood and the, the brain matter and flesh and all that kind of stuff that was hanging around was gone. And they said they, they, they didn't, they couldn't do no forensics test or nothing. They couldn't, all they did, they, they, they took some pictures. But he said the place was cleaned up except for a little few blood stains here and there. They couldn't, you know, there was nothing for them to deal with. So then anyone can say any story. They can tell right. any story, and, and it's hard to corroborate what happened. Exactly. So she went back, cleaned the, cr the crime. She tampered with the crime scene. Yeah. Right? Tampered with it. Get rid of all the evidence that the cops needed so that they can do their investigation. They, you know, they needed proof of what happened. They didn't find none except for a, a few little dried up blood stains here and there. But the main area, where all the stuff happened was cleaned up. That's crazy. So now, so now all of a sudden, all of a sudden now, I'm the guy who is now being blamed because, oh, they could have been saved if I never drove away and left them to die. This is what this guy did, his little thing on um, YouTube. Oh, Santa Davis drove away and left his friends to die. I'm like, really, dude? Really? You didn't even have the integrity to try to get an audience with me, try to hear yeah. from me what happened so I can right. tell you the truth of what happened. You're just going to do me like that 
and push my name out in the music world, having people looking at me like I'm some evil dude. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then, then he was even saying stuff like, oh, I wonder who really put all that together. Like, he was now insinuating like, I had something to do with the murder of my brother. Now, wait a minute. So now, we just finished an album. He had just, we had just finished No Nuclear War. We were getting ready to hit the road. Me and Peter was talking about how we're gonna do the stage setup and stage plots <laughs> and we were going through all that. Wait a minute. So now I'm I'm an idiot, right? That I'm gonna set up my yeah. brethren to be killed. This is my this is my breadbasket. This is <laughs> this is how I make a living. I'm gonna destroy that. I'm gonna destroy my income. We're getting ready to go on the road and 20 other people, 20, 30 other people, they're talking about musicians and crews. And I'm going to destroy that. For what? For what? How are you going to involve me into some low down stuff like that? But people are like that, you know? They always try to find somebody to blame. So, yeah, you did it. Yeah, he's the reason why. And, you know, be careful of this guy because I'm like, Really? It's fear, and they are obviously not connected in the allowing. But what did you take away from that when you, when you grieved and you finally could even wrap your head around what had happened? Because there's that point where, okay, the trauma, the acute trauma, now the emotional trauma, you get out of the hospital, you're healed, but everybody's gone. It's just that, that weird void time. How did you manage through that, and what happened to you next? I'm still grieving. It doesn't stop. It never stops. I'm still grieving because it's just the way, because I've never had no family member. I, I don't, there, there was no one super close to me like that who got killed tragically. And I pray to God it never happened again. But I've never had that happen. Peter Tosh, was the closest person to me as a brother. Because it, the way he treated me, the way he would teach me stuff. You know, I learned, I learned so much as a, Peter Tosh is my big brother. He, he, yeah. I, st I still say he, he is because I looked at his picture, I'll be here working stuff, and I would say, this is how Peter would do it. You know what I mean? So I learned so much from this guy. You know what I mean? So, that feeling has never went away because, okay, Peter Tosh, if I'd heard that he died in a car crash, I would understand because Peter was a hard driver. He, he was like, <laughs> he, he drove hard. He could drive. He was a great driver. You know what we call that in New York? We call that effective driving. <laughs> yeah. No, he, you know, so Peter Tosh was, he was, he, he was dangerous. I mean, so if I'd heard that he died in a car crash, I would never enjoy that either. I, I, I wouldn't have like, oh, well, you know, that was, that was expected. But at least I would have known that, oh, damn, man. You know? Yeah. What happened, you know? Oh, he was driving and he skid off the road or something or something ran into him. You know what I mean? That would have been different. But the fact that I was there, I was there when that man took, first of all, Peter Tosh was beaten savagely. I mean, this man was beside me and he was bawling, bawling like a child. You know, I, I hate to say it like that because I didn't want to put my friend like that, but you got to let it out sometime. And, and, and I can still remember that, you know? And he was there getting beat. They asking for money, asking for money. And he didn't have any money at the time. I mean, not that he was broke, but he never had no money right there. And to see 
My, every time he, he would get a hit, my body shake. He was that close to me. I would feel every time he got hit. That's so tragic, and it's so and, traumatic for right. you. And I'm there. Can you? No. Imagine you are with your friend. He's getting beat, beaten to a pulp, and you can't do crap about it. Imagine not feeling. You are helpless. Cause you got guys with guns on you. How the hell? Well, I'm not Superman. But can you imagine that feeling? Yeah. If your friend getting beat, it's and a, you it's... can't do one damn thing about it, right? So I keep I remember that, and that that that's gonna live with me, un, until I leave this earth. You see what I'm saying? And my friend died beside me. But, you know, I've had a lot of visions. I don't tell a lot of people this. I was going to say, you must spiritually but know, though, he's with you. The first time, I'm going to tell you this, because I never said this to nobody. The first, well, you're going to hear it <laughs> the first time. The first vision I got with Peter, it's kind of, it's weird. It's one of the weirdest things. So, I'm sleeping. And all of a sudden, I, I, it's like, it seems like real. Peter Tosh was exercising. <laughs> and, and he had on one of his track suits. Because he used to wear his track suits and he would tuck, his, tuck the legs into his socks. He would, he would put the, 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 the legs of the top into his socks and he have on his track shoes and stuff like that. He didn't have no shirt on. And he was drenching with sweat. He was wet. And he was training. And I'm like, I said to him, hey, what, boss? And getting free. He said, yeah, man. And he was smiling. That's the first vision I got with Peter. He was happy. Happier, happier than I ever seen before. Like he was radiant and like, whoa. And when I got that, because for a while, I just, I was thinking about him like, damn, Peter just died like that, brother. You know, and it was right here in California. I'm sleeping, and all of a sudden, boom, I see it. And Peter, he said, yeah, man, I'm getting fit, man. I'm getting fit, getting trained. And he was, he was just drenching with sweat with a big, broad smile on his face. And when I saw, I woke up, like, whoa, wait a minute, you know? And then I felt like a calmness, like, like he was trying to say to me, hey, I'm good. You know, that was the first time. I'm good. And then I've had out of vision with Peter on more kind of, because he, Peter was a man of many moods. But, you know, he would have somber moods and he would have, because Peter was like a kid, you know, he would crack jokes and talk stuff and, you know, and we would laugh, you know, and then he would have serious topics that he would get on. So, you know, he was, you know, he was multi, you know. And, but I've got, gotten a lot of out of visions with Peter. So I've seen him, like he, he presented himself to me. And they, they all seemed real, like, I'm trying to think if I'm sleeping or I'm dreaming or something, you know? And then I'll wake up like, whoa, that one was close. <laughs> you know, so, oh, yeah. so, so, so it was, so I still, every now and again, he doesn't appear to me all the time, but the first one, was him sweating, smiling, exercising, and he was like letting me know, hey man, just be cool. Like he's, like he's basically saying to me, don't listen to what they're saying. You're all right. You're all right with me, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's did. the most important thing, yeah. yeah. You so, you that. know, when I see stuff like that, I like, you know what? Because people were trying to say to me, man, Sandy, you gotta do a video. You gotta go out there and make a video and tell. I said, look, I don't owe that to nobody to try to explain this. Good for you. Really, good for you. Because then if I start doing that, then you know what they're going to say? Oh, maybe he's guilty and he's trying to cover something up. No. I don't have to explain to nobody because I know what happened. And guess what? The reality is I'm still walking with that bullet in me. I still have a bullet in me. You know, so I'm like, I'm not that, like, it's unique. Because there's lots of people out there with, with more bullets in their body than me, <laughs> you know. 
But I'm one of them. I'm no different. I almost died. You know, so, you know. It's but, tragic, and you, and you took away positivity, though, and you were able to yeah. continue to walk and and move forward and still inspire people and, and carry that light. But But that's what Peter would want. You know, that's what he would want because that's that's why, you know, when I remember him, I remember the inspiration and 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 and, and the commitment that he had in doing what he, the seriousness of how you know he saw things. You know, so that's the same determination I have. That's why that's why I show you his picture every now and again. I looked up, I look at Bob. Bob is looking over at him, and he's looking. <laughs> so I'm just right there. They, they're still having conversation in my in my world, you know. They're right there, you know. Yeah. So so you know, I mean, there's still that that sadness, but but at the same time, there's still that joy, you know, because they're not in pain no more, you know. And I know that they they, they gave me that assurance that hey, it's alright, you know, don't worry about it. And 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 just like you asked me, how I how I dealt with it all these years. I really don't know, you know, because everybody deal with post-traumatic stress or whatever you call it in different ways. Some people go out of their mind. Some people get, you know, whatever. But I realize, you know, something happened that you had no control over and you just have to just see it for what it is and just accept the fact, that, okay, it happened. But what are you going to do? Are you going to tarnish that? Are you going to keep it going? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Are you gonna keep their legacy alive? You know, yeah. you know. So, so, so that's what I'm doing. You know, when somebody asks me questions about, I, I can, I will, I will always have good, positive things to say about Peter, Bob, Bonnie, and that whole group of people. And see, you carry the light, and you're carrying that light forward, and yeah. just just the sharing of your life and your story in this and the courage that you've had to stand up through that loss as well as someone trying to take you down after that. I mean, that's heartbreaking and, and just soul crushing. And yet here you are still humble and carrying the light. And the best part of all is you're still connected in spirit with them and you know it and nobody can take that from you. No, you know what? It could have gone a lot of, I could be the most angriest guy right now. Yeah. Going on social, like you see all these people on social media talking all kind of crap. <laughs> no, but I said, that, that's not me. That's not me. You know, just like, just like Bob Marley and, you know, Bob Marley went through, people would wonder, how come Bob Marley sings song like that? Didn't know that Bob Marley went through discrimination in Jamaica, you know? racial discrimination basically because you know Bob Marley was a lighter skin he was a light skinned person and he went through that and I don't I don't think I don't think it was I don't think it was um like spiteful I think it was just out of you know childish mockery you know you know they used to say oh you you are oh, you white man are you you know whatever but I don't think it was like, oh, I don't like you because you, it, it, it wasn't anything like that. But he went through the humiliation of being called a, a white man's child or whatever, you know, you know, whatever. But mm -hmm. guess what? Instead of him, you know, saying, you know what, I'm going to be this angry, angry man. I'm just going to just hate people. What he did, he took all of that negativity and he balled it up. Ball it up and say, you know what? I'm gonna love y'all. Yes, yes, yes. I'm gonna love you all. And if you listen to some of his interviews, he said, look, his life is for the people. And if his life is if his life is not for the people, then him don't want it. Listen to that. So this man was a selfless person. He wasn't thinking of himself, even after going through his form of, you know racial discrimination and what have you, and hardship. When you talk about cold ground with his bed and 
rock out his pillow and all these things. But man, he went through all those hardships. But he used those negatives and boiled them up into positive energy. So, you know, this is the type of thing that inspires me, you know? This is what keeps me going, you know? I can see. I can see why. Yeah. I mean, it makes yeah. me cry. It just, yeah. it, it's humbling just to hear it and, and you not, realize. I'm not angry. I'm not, even to be honest with you, the type of person I am, I've even forgiven all those people who've been saying crap about me since the incident. That's what, it's 33 years now, right? And you know what, I say, you know what? I cannot walk around being bitter at these people because it's like in the Bible where they say Christ was on the cross and, 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 and Christ say, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. And that's kind of my way of dealing with it. And I realize there was an essence to that. Because if I, if I harbor hate, if I harbor resentment and anger, then I'm going to be worse than those people. And I can't say, oh, I'm doing good works and trying to be positive and still in the back of my mind, I have all this hate and all this festering negativity going on. No, you, you can't live. I, I, I'm not that dual. Yeah, and it's a little bit like the story of the fig tree, right? Yeah. You lose your faith and you cast negativity or doubt on something and then it just it shrivels up and dies. And that's exactly. not what this is about. This is no. about, and it's music, which is in your soul, is about lifting up. It's about yeah. putting light and life back into the world, not taking oh, yeah. it away. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. To me, that's the most important thing. So, you know, I just, I just say... Just like I said with Bob, I just ball up all that negative energy. I forgive those people. Yes, I do. Even, even the people who shot me. I'm like, you know what, Lord, forgive them. Yeah. I'm still here, so guess what? I'm not going to walk around being bitter and saying, oh, if I catch those guys, what I would do to them. Uh -uh. It's not about that. I'm alive because the good Lord say, live. You know, so... What, 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 what must I do is forgive them and love them. Just like, that's not for me to judge. People say, how can you love what, what, what Christ said, love your enemy as you love his, whoa, wait a minute. All right, there you go. He said, love your enemy. You can't, because they hating you don't mean that you have to hate them. Right, exactly. That's their problem. Yeah. You want to hate me? Fine. Why? Well, I, I don't hate you. <laughs> I love, I, that's not. That's not on me. You. You hate me. You don't like me that much. Ah, oh, cool. Fine. At least I know. But I love you. Yeah. And I have to keep. I have to keep that within me. <laughs> and you I'm know? going back to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're gonna make some good music today. <laughs> exactly. Look, I'm doing things today that I never thought I could have done. Like what? I make, I, I make all my songs by myself. I'm playing drums. I play, I got this little acoustic bass right here, but I got more basses. So I got, got three more basses over there. I don't play guitar though, but I'm doing these things not even realizing that I could do them, but get in the situation where it's kind of hard to call, yeah, I want to do this thing and then try to call somebody to come. It's kind of weird, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I say, you know what, let me see if I can just, I have my guitar player, he comes over every now and again, but I would do like the basic stuff, what I'm doing, and then, you know, he, he come and do, the, do his stuff. But the thing is this, I think all of that is because of how I choose to live my life. And then by, by living my life, the best way I can with, with, with pursuing love and clarity and decency and what have you, I think that spirit is, is what gives me the, you know, the, the view, you know, yeah. the view to say, okay, you can do that. Even though you doubt yourself, like, nah, I don't, I'm not a bass player. Okay, <laughs> dum, dum, dum. oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm, get, I'm, get, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting this high, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not, 
a trained bass player or a trained keyboard player. Because I, I, can't, I can't do the two-fisted thing like some people. I can yeah. do one hand. <laughs> Play. <laughs> play a couple of, and then I would go back and layer the chords so it sounds like this guy is playing with his with two hands. But that's cool because I've seen a lot of great keyboard players that just use one hand and do stuff. So that's cool. But the thing is, is what I'm saying, I'm enjoying life as I should. Yeah. I'm not bitter with nothing, no bitterness, no anger, no envy, no jealousy, none of all that stuff. Because I don't need that. Because I know that's what that is what tarnish your soul, you know? Oh, yeah. Your, no. soul, your soul gets tarnished when you keep all these crap inside of you, you know? I don't need all that. I love this. I'm, I'm so joyful to get to be a recipient of this message and, and your spirit today. I mean that sincerely. Thank you. I'm, I've learned a lot in listening to you and I have a lot to contemplate and examine in myself. I appreciate what you've said. I'm going to take this and, and contemplate it for quite a long time. Seriously. You've made me a better person just by sharing today. And, and I mean that I'm, I'm getting teary. I, the, the only, the only way we can survive in this world, the only way we can feel peaceful, is by exhibiting that, is by immersing yourself into that. You know what I mean? And yeah, you know, we still have our little, we still have little rough edges we got to clean up and stuff. But at the same time, at least you're admitting to your faults and you're making effort to clean it up, you know? Oh, yeah. But that's it, what we it, other it, people for, to remind us. <laughs> right, right. You know? Because it's like, it's, like it's like somebody being an alcoholic. And yeah. you keep telling them, man, you're an alcoholic. He said, no, I'm not. He's like, yeah, man, you, you need to stop drinking so much. Every time you drink, you're stumbling all over. No, man, I'm not stumbling. We don't. But until that person yeah. decides that, you know what? You're right. I'm an alcoholic. That's the beginning of healing. Yeah. You know? So I just think that for me, it, 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 it's, it's constant. You have to be consistent with your feelings, with your belief, and, you know, work at it, you know, because as you say, sometimes you fall off track. But, you know, I'll be driving on the street and some guy cut me off and I'm like, I I'm about to get angry. I'm like, oh, no, wait, whoa, whoa, you don't want to go there. <laughs> it's not going to end well. <sighs> All right, cool. You know, so you keep adjusting, you know, just stop and correct. You, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. You, you, but you have to acknowledge it to stop and correct. And a lot of people yeah. don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, it, and that's why I say it's it's a consistent living, you know, living your life and seeking, you know, you're seeking, seeking. you know, you just, you, you know, you, just, you, you have to do it, you know, and that's how I keep calm. People say, man, how do you do that? Oh, you have to, I have to see. I mean, I've never been, that's the first time, and I pray to God that I never see that again. Yeah. Three people dying beside me, three of my friends, who want to see that? But it happened. And I learned from it. I, I, I realized how oh, easy, you know? But at the same time, I can't keep living my life thinking of the evil that was done. I still have to say, you know what? As tragic as it was, I still have to be positive. I still have to memorialize these people clarity with love with honor you know honor. instead of being bitter because yeah. they they wouldn't want me to be bitter so all i have to do is just say you know what it happened nothing i can do to change that but let me honor their memory in the best possibly positive clean way i can you know so well, when i think I talk, you so, are that you do that yeah you do embody that of all the people that you've worked with in your career, who are some of the most inspirational for your growth personally and musically? Hmm. I have to go back to these people again. The Whalers. Because they are a commitment to what they do. They have a certain way how they go about doing it. They were, you know, and we just 
we just had another brother who passed away on 9-11, Toots Ebert. Toots on 9-11? That's, that's strange. Yeah, he, he had the COVID. They said, oh, they said, yeah. they said he had the COVID, in, oh. right? Sorry. So all those people. So I learned, okay, so I used to, I, I used to work with Jimmy Cliff also. So I learned from Jimmy Cliff commitment, you know, to, 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 you know, Jimmy Cliff is also that spiritual person to it, 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 you know? So I learned a lot by working with those people. You know what I mean? I learned a lot from, from Toots, Ibert, God rest his soul. And Peter Tash, Bonnie Whalers, Bob Marley, you know? Those people, because they, they're kind of like the people who, I would say, they set the table that I could eat. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And when I listen to their composition and the way they, you, you can realize they experience a lot of what they, and, and, and why I believe, why I'm so inspired by these people who I just called. They lived it. They, they, it not, they, they didn't just write some lyrics. It's either they went through it or they, they, were, they, they, they saw it. You know, like you hear, you know, as I talk about Toots Ebert, he passed away and he's, he had a song called 5446. And 5446 was his prison number when he was in prison. You see what I'm saying? So he's singing about, you know, so all these people sing about life stories and things that they were involved in and surrounded by. So it's all real to me. You know, when I hear it, I say, well, you know, everything you do should be about life's experience so it can resonate with others. Because people need that. You know, if you have something, maybe if you say something, somebody can say, oh, wait a minute. You know what? I've been through that, but I never thought of it that way. Oh. And then you can bring somebody down off of whatever high, negative high that they were on. Mm -hmm. you know, or negative lows. You bring them, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so the thing is this, you know, you have to be able to, to relate your, your life story to others because we're all connected. We're all the same. Yeah. It doesn't, re we're it all doesn't one. really matter. You know, we're, we're one people. Yeah. People, I don't like, you know, I don't like this whole idea of looking at people, white, black, and Hispanic. Amen. People. I don't either. I like that. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I really, I don't like that because that's not what God intended. God never intended for us to. Oh, oh, your your skin is white and my skin is black. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, you Mexican and you're Chinese. What? Wait a minute. God never started. God never started that. We started it. We start figuring out. Oh, no, 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 no. Human being. Yeah. You're my friend. You're my sister. You know, you 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 family. We all are family. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> we twisted. all are family. Cause look. Look, look what's going on with this COVID thing. There's nobody who is insulated or isolated or whatever you want to call it from this thing. If it catches you, catch him, you know? <laughs> and we all go through the same thing. So we have to learn that, you know, you know, we are our one people. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that I learned from these brothers. You know, they were real. They were real people. They they related to real situations, you know. And that's so hey, beautiful. And I'm, I, I'm I'm just carrying that with me, you know. You are, you are, you you've been through so much. You have so much to share. Do you ever work with other musicians, or do you ever mentor people? Do you take time and um, are you connected to anything like that in what you do? Well, I mean. Indirectly, I'm you'd be, you'd like be good at it. <laughs> yeah, in, yeah, in the, yeah, indirectly, I kind of mentored a lot of people because, you know, people, I would play on records and stuff like that and people would recognize my drumming and a lot of drummers, they would listen to my record and not my record. Well, yeah, I have a couple of stuff, but they would listen to stuff I've been involved with and they would learn, man, 
Santa Davis, I learned this lick from you, man. I listened to that song you did with so-and-so and so, you know, so, you know, we, I've never really held classes and stuff like that, but I've held classes in that. Yeah. <laughs> People learn from the works I've did over the years. So, you know, so, and, and, and then again, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people, you know, over the years, you know, like, hey, you know, I had conversations and they would ask me stuff and I give it to them freely because that's what it's supposed to be, you know? Yeah. You know, keep it free. Say, people, anything you want to ask me about music, drumming, how do I do this, I'm going to show you. I'm going to point you in the right direction. So, you know. Beautiful. It's just, it just, it just part of the, the process and the progression of life. You, know, you have to keep that goodness going you know, the best you can. Santa Davis, I have to say, you have definitely made my life brighter today. And I want to say thank you for coming and being with us. And I've held you for a long time here. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm cool. I'm, it's not like I have anywhere to go right now. <laughs> I, so, I so appreciate this. And I know so many other people will too, because yeah. you're an inspiration and, and you're so successful in what you've done. That's one thing that's carried through despite the tragedy. You mm -hmm. continue to have... I would say, um, inspired successes and you've been led down this journey, down the road, don't you think? Down the path? Yeah, man. You know, you have to be, you have to be positive. You have to be, you know, regardless of what, you know, curveball, you know, life, life throw at you. You know, you, you, you just, you can't just sit down, oh, woe is me and, oh, man, why is this happening to me? You should accept it. Oh, I'm, I'm happy that this happened to me so now I can assess my priorities and say, okay, what are you going to do about it? I want it what are you going to do? Well, what, you know? So, okay, cool. All right. Well, this happened to me. Okay. Now this is a good template for me to work with so I can show other people, don't do this, don't do that. You know, it, it's, to me, you know, life, life happens, you know, and things in life happen to you in order for you to help others to, you know because sometimes people you know I've, I've seen people in weird situations and just by me talking to them because i remember I, I have a friend in jamaica right so i normally you know i don't call people all the time but i randomly i would just say oh i haven't spoken to winifred in a, in a while i'll just call you so i call this friend of mine in jamaica and I just called him and, and he, I said, what's up, Shel what's up, Shelton? And he was like, and he paused for a while. I was like, uh-oh, did I call him at a bad time? And he paused for a few seconds. I, and I was like, I waited. I said, oh, maybe he's doing something. I said, hey, you there? And then he, he came down with a sigh like, man, you know, I wasn't expecting this call, but it's such a welcome sight or a welcome feeling. And then me and him start having a conversation. And then he started telling me, you know, because maybe he wanted somebody to talk. And normally when he and I have conversation, it was always on positive levels, you know. And he started telling me that, oh, yeah, he was having some difficulties. I said, what kind of difficulty? Let me know, man. And he, he, he was saying, well, he and his wife, they're having these difficulties and da 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 and it was that. And he started talking and he said, man, you know, she's angry at him and she's saying that, but she's this and she's that. And, that. and then he kept talking. And throughout the conversation, I listened. And then he was just saying what she was saying and what she was doing and what she was saying. And then I said to him, I said, Shelton, my brother, even though she might be saying these things that she might be wrong, but you also have to accept your part in what's going on. You have to act, even though she's wrong, but you have to admit your faults too. Because if you're going to just say it's her, and what about you? You, got so, you? you know you have something to do with it. You got to. You, you, it's both of you. And we went in, to like deep, deep, deep into, this, into that topic. And he's just like, wow. He said, man, I needed to hear that because I wasn't thinking of it like that. I saved his marriage. 
<laughs> so now, now you're a marriage counselor too. <laughs> hey, you were saying that, right, man? You know, but 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 the, but that's the thing, you know. You know, life you is a thing where the, you were inspired to call in that moment, and you listen. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of moment. yeah, and a lot of time I would call people like that, just random. I get, I would get this <laughs> feeling of like, hey, I was spoken to somebody, and said, call him, man. I'm glad you called me, man. I needed somebody. And we start going off. And that's how it is, man. It's just communication. Man. We have to communicate. You know? It is. And you know what? I just have to say, you give the greatest hugs. I, I really yeah, always thought that. We're, whenever we've met, and, and even in passing, it's just a hello, how are you, and a, and right. a quick, you know, brotherly, sisterly hug. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's always so warm. Your heart is right front and center. And I, <laughs> I've always thought that. But the thing is this. If, if if I'm gonna embrace you, if it's not if it's not genuine, I'm not gonna do it. Yeah. I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna hug you just, oh, I wanna hug on to this lady. No. It has to be deep. It has to be it has to be real. Well, so it when I like that. <laughs> you know, when I when I do it and I make sure, you know, hug you decently, make sure, you know, when I, it just it's just me. I I I have to be real with myself. Yeah, in order you, for me to you be. walk through the world that way. Don't you worry. Everybody yeah. sees that. And thanks, and thanks to my mama in heaven. <laughs> your mama and and all of your spirit friends, which I can feel readily around you. Yeah. And uh, that is a beautiful thing. I knew that speaking to you today would bring out so much and and i'm grateful i'm so grateful to you for this thank you so much and maybe you can come back and and visit us again and even play a little something for us another time oh yeah thanks for having me and it, it was a pleasure you know it was a pleasure santa davis he is yes. a musician extraordinaire drummer percussionist and i you know we can make the list of all the things that you've done in the world but I think what we've talked about today is so much more. You yeah. are you, this beautiful light being that allows. And I can't say thank you enough. <laughs> You've yeah, delighted well, me. Thank you. I just say all we have to do is just spread the love. Spread, spread the love. The love. So there you have it. It's the only thing we can do. I mean, you know, spread the love, you know. And where can people find your music and it's, all the things a, that you're doing? It's a, I, have, I have a couple of stuff. It's on iTunes iTunes, um, I think Spotify, Amazon, they, you know, because I do, I run my stuff through CD Baby, so they post it all over these, you know, so you can, yeah. Everywhere, all the digital outlets. You can find yes, Santa Davis yes. and all the digital outlets. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, Carlton Santa Davis, boom. There you, you go. See, you see my little projects just pops up, pop up and open, oh, oh, say, what is that? <laughs> what, <laughs> what kind of crap is that? <laughs> no, no, it's... <laughs> No. There's some good stuff there, yeah. Oh, thank you, and God bless you. Go jolly. That's what I have to say. You made everybody yes. else's life brighter, and uh, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. You know, I mean, bring joy and happiness to everyone's soul. You know, because we are soul people, really. We are not just people. We are soul people, and 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 if we, if what if what I say to you, or you say to me, resonate. That means. It's touching the soul. That's why people get angry because they don't understand. But it's because of the energy yeah. that's being let off. So we are soul people. And that's how we connect, you know? We connect yeah. through the soul. So spread the love. I feel it. Go Jolly, everybody. Thank you for listening. We'll have Santa Davis back again. And uh, I'm going to share with you a thing that I did sometime. It was really funny. Uh, I mm -hmm. did this music thing for actually a jewelry show and I had these Jamaican fellas do the intro. You're going to die yeah. laughing. Okay. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> yeah. All right. Santa Davis, there you have it, everybody. Go and make somebody else's life brighter. Blessings by people. Yes. Go, Charlie. All right. All right.